Francesca Martinez is a comedian, an actor, a campaigner, an all-round good egg. Now, she went viral last week uh, when she was on Question Time talking about the tens of thousands of avoidable deaths caused by austerity. And it hit home in a nation where we've had now a decade nearly of cots which have had such a devastating impact on so many people's lives and she really brought it to the fore. Now, I want to talk to her about her own experience as a disabled person, uh, talking about the cuts that disabled people have suffered, about austerity, about the cuts and the privatisation in the National Health Service. But I also want to talk to her about her hope and optimism for the future. So here we are in the pink room. This is pretty, I mean, I think I already make our videos camp enough, but this really is very camp. And I tried to coordinate with the camera. Francesca, you were already, you're already a superstar, but you were even more of a superstar uh, after going viral on Question Time. And I think whatever your politics, you can agree that punishing disabled people and sick people for falling on the hard times is absolutely morally wrong and they have blood on their hands. I was their first ever wobbly guest and I wanted to fly the wob wobbly flag. <laughs> um, and I was so, so, so pleased that I could talk about austerity and all the people that have suffered and died. I feel it's quite a disgrace that it's been so ignored. So my kind of desire um, when I went on was to try and redress that balance a little bit and speak up for people who really don't have much of a voice um, in this world. And uh, I've been overwhelmed by the response um, very touched, had so many messages of people with heartbreaking stories um, saying, thank God someone's voiced our experience. So we've had nearly a decade now of austerity. And, yeah. and, and the, 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 the research you drew attention to was 130,000 preventable deaths yeah. caused by austerity policies. What is a scandal? We're talking about tens of thousands of people. Why don't you think it's got the attention? It's I think there's a few um, reasons. So I think stories such as, you know, over 100,000 of our British people dying due to cuts, I don't think that's a very politically convenient truth. I also think that many poor and disabled people and sick people and those with mental health issues, I think they're regarded as easy targets sometimes. So I think there's this horrible sense of like, it doesn't matter, no one will really care. And that really infuriates me because I think a civilised country should be proud to fund those who need it. Um, secondly, I think there's still quite a lot of myths around austerity like Austerity was really bad, but it kind of had to be done. It was a difficult decision. Um, but I think that's a myth that really needs busting. And my feeling is austerity is working really well for those that it was designed to work for. And if it's not about saving money, what is it about? Well, I think austerity is about really changing the culture we live in. So taking away people's expectations of support when they hit our times, taking away the collective safety net that people like you and I have grown up with. And I think it's really about changing us into a culture like America, where if you get sick or ill or become disabled, you're on your own. How do you sum up the tr how disabled people overall have been treated in terms of, you know, their lived experience? What, it, what it's like to suffer, not just the figures we can, you know, statistics, yeah. but the actual lived experience of what disabled people have gone through. So it's not just attack, an attack on people's um, support and finances. It's also a psychological attack. So I was born wobbly 
and all my life I've struggled with asking for help and I really had to fight that, I went to therapy for that, I really had to work hard to be proud of myself and to accept that every human being needs help and I was no different and just because I can't pick up a glass or walk on my own it doesn't mean that I'm weak. Um, I you to pick up a glass. I'm sorry. Uh, it's all that was right. probably Rub subliminal. It, in, <laughs> <laughs> it was subliminal. Uh, thanks, <laughs> um, so I think one of the most kind of tragic things about this current culture of shame around needing help is that it, it's really forcing people like me to have to beg for our basic human rights. Um, so the fact that I'm now assessed every few years, um, it's not an opinion that I'm wobbly. It's not an opinion as to whether I'll improve or not. It's a scientific fact I'm wobbly and I will never ever be able to do certain things. And instead of the state saying, we get that, and we've decided that collectively we're going to chip in and try and level up the playing field. We're now looking at a culture which makes me feel humiliated and embarrassed for having to ask for help. The NHS, the National Health Service, is one of our proudest institutions, yeah. created after the war. And I suppose kind of exemplifies this idea of you put people's needs ahead of profit and money. But what, what do you think's happened to the NHS in the last few years? I think it's very scary what's happening. So in the 1980s, we had 300,000 beds. Now we have half that figure. That's an astonishing cut. So over the last 30 years, we've seen our NHS cut up into chunks and sold off. And we are very, very near having a, an American-type private health insurance system. So I also want to point out, you know, if you're sitting at home thinking, well, I'm wealthy, I'll be all right. Um, this is bad for everyone because um, many insurance companies don't cover loads of conditions or disabilities. So we're going to have awful situations where, where many people can't get cover. And I think we've got very clear choice next election between Labour, who have pledged to renationalise it and keep it public, and the Tories, who will put the nail in the coffin and bring in what America has. So Bob Johnson, as things stand, is about to become our Prime Minister. Yes. What, 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 just, what's your take on that? What's your fear about that, if you like? I would say that one of the reasons I think the world is in such a mess is can we value the wrong human qualities? Mm. Now, I think we elevate the wrong people into power all the time. So I think too often the people who rise to the top are the most cutthroat, the most devious, the most amoral, the most power-hungry people. And so I think Boris really um, exemplifies the type of person who will do anything for power. We all know his voting record. We all know the fact that as London mayor, he broke multiple promises. So brace yourself. Yeah. Hold up, one second. Hard question coming up. It isn't, no. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. It's Grange Hill. That's a Grange Hill theme tune. And this, in Grange Hill. And this is what the whole intro is leading up to. It wasn't. It? Okay. it was actually. Um, no, obviously we're talking about saving the world yeah. from imminent calamity. But, but let's it, talk about Grange Hill. Yeah, I remember watching Grange Hill when yeah. I was a kid. Oh, you saw me looking. What do you reckon? Mm, not bad. You can have the other one. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I, I was a big fan of Grey Hill, loved it. Are you very starstruck right there? Obviously, always starstruck when I meet you, Francesca. Um, but you were actually one of, I would say, because there's not, even now, that many disabled characters on television, 
Didn't that make a bit of an impact? Do you have people yeah. go, we've got some sort of representation? Yeah, I mean, I was 14 when I got it. Mm -hmm. And I've got to say, I'm so happy because I hated my real school. <laughs> and it was just a, a complete dream come true for me because I'd always wanted to act. And I think the show really wanted to reflect modern day schooling as it was. Mm -hmm. And it did have an impact. And I'm really pleased because I think the kids just accepted my character, Rachel, just another schoolgirl. And that was the whole point, just to normalise difference. Final question, really profound. I've been asked to ask yeah. it, so. Kate Winslet, what was it like to work with her? Really <laughs> profound. Hard-hitting okay. questions. So you were talking about extras with Ricky. Yeah. And I've got to say that when I got extras, I was the biggest Ricky Gervais fan in the universe. <laughs> OK? And because I love The Office so much, I, love the office. I must have watched it like a hundred times. So when I got the call to do um, extras, I was absolutely... So I was like, I can just die happy now. <laughs> um, so when it came to filming, I didn't even give a toss about Kate Winslet. <laughs> he was nothing to me. I was just, I was just happy to be on set with Ricky Gervais. To have my wobbly walk taken a piss out of by Ricky Gervais. <laughs> Bloody brilliant. Francesca, it's been an absolute pleasure. Wobbly high five. <laughs> I think Francesca's really cool and I think it's so important that we hear about the lived experiences of disabled people because all too often their voices have been airbrushed out of the political debate when they've suffered many of the worst excesses of austerity and cuts in this country and I think she really passionately brings out what so many people have suffered and what we don't hear about enough but also that optimism she's got I think it's pretty contagious but I want to hear your thoughts I particularly would love to hear from disabled people who may have suffered as a consequence of cuts themselves or maybe family or friend or relatives or whatever I just want to hear about people's hope you know are we gonna maybe turn a corner is austerity gonna come crashing to an end but as ever we love to hear your ideas about who we should chat to who we should interview uh, we've got loads of interviews, so please do click on them. As ever, subscribe. I'll see you next time.